The world is hurting and desperately in need of a savior. Let's take the word of faith and hope to every nation and transform the world. This is the vision and mission of Team International. For more information, contact us at www.teamministriesinternational.com.
The world has changed. So must we. Reach out to people. Tell them about Jesus and run with the divine mandate of team. I've titled today's message, Understanding the Law of Time and Season. If you have a good Bible, let's open our Bibles briefly to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Luke chapter 12, 56. Hypocrites, you can descend the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not descend this time? You know, sometimes I am perplexed when I see people telling me that life's not been fair to them. And I hear people complain about many things. Things that sometimes can take us into endless theological debates. And I came to a conclusion that the reason people can get into such arguments, sometimes unfruitful arguments, is because they fail to understand the consistency of time and seasons. There's nothing that happens on this planet by accident. Everything was deliberately planned or ignorantly planned. Your life is not a product of accident. Everything about your destiny, everything about your life was deliberately planned by God. You may have been ignorant about your past. But with knowledge, you can't claim to be ignorant of your future. You may not be responsible for your past carelessness. But you can't plant a seed without reaping the harvest tomorrow. Therefore, your life was deliberately planned by God. God uses the consistency of time and seasons as legitimate divine principles to fulfill his purpose on earth. The seed of knowledge is the key to a season of great harvest and a productive destiny. This fundamental law helps people and nations to fulfill their destinies. I want you to know that the purpose of God is greater than your pleasure, preferences, or pain. Those who fail to submit to God's purpose will eventually experience the pain of adversity. That's why your life has to be planned. That's why you have to live an intentional lifestyle. That's why your destiny is in your hands. That's why success or failure is in your hands. That's why happiness or sadness is in your hands. That's why greatness or fame or insignificance is in your hands. That's why the capacity to be holy or to live a lawless, unholy life is in your hands. That's why the capacity to create wealth or to live in miserable poverty is in your hands. The Bible tells me in the book of Proverbs chapter 24, verse 4 to 6, By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Knowledge is what gives you the capacity to shine and rise above insignificance. What do you do with what you have? What have you done with what you have? 
The truth is some of you are just spiritually and mentally irresponsible. You learn all the time, but you apply nothing. Learning is nothing if application is zero. You must apply what you know so that you can change your destiny. You must apply what you know so that you can transform your nation. How do you see yourself? Nothing happens by chance. Destiny is not a product of chance or a product of deliberate choices. Every day we are engaged in making choices, rational or sometimes irrational, intentional or non-intentional choices are made. The quality of choices you make will determine everything about your destiny. Imagine. A couple comes to me and they tell me that our marriage is giving us a hard time. All I need to do is to take the forensic, mental, or spiritual forensic analysis of the relationship and I can come out with a, a spiritual hypothetical statement. You've been married for 15, 16, 17 years and you have made no sacrifice. And you expect all the good things to happen to you. That's the way a criminal thinks. A criminal wants to harvest where he never sold. I can tell you statistically that if you have wasted 17 years of your marriage putting nothing, the next 17 years you are going to harvest nothing. If you've wasted 17 years of your marriage sowing distrust, sowing dishonesty, 17 years later, you are going to have a harvest of distrust and dishonesty. And that, let me tell you something about seed. You know, seed is the only substance that when you plant it and when it grows, it does not just grow. It multiplies itself to a great proportion. In every seed lies a tree. In every tree lies a forest. In every forest, you have the capacity to produce a jungle. In every cow, you have a herd. Within you lies the capacity to create nations. If you have invested your time the past three years and doing all manner of things, the next three years is going to be difficult. But we thank God for redemption. Today the Bible says, when you hear the sound of God's voice, do not harden your heart. That is why you need to redeem your time. All the time spent in foolishness needs to be redeemed. All the time spent in gossip needs to be redeemed. All the time spent in saying bad things needs to be redeemed. You redeem time by working much more harder than you ought to have worked. Well, we thank God for God's grace. In most nations of the world, we've entered the political era where elections are freely run. And they ask you to choose the best candidates of your choice. There's nothing wrong with democratic aspirations. But I need to inform you. A candidate that tells you that if you vote for me, and in four years time, in six years time, in, in five years time, I'm going to turn your nation that's going through hell into paradise is lying to you. If it took... 50 years and 100 years of existence, the existence of a nation, to put the structure of corruption in place is going to take at least 50 years of dedicated work to abolish every form of corruption and set your nation in the right path. Have you seen any nation that was in a terrible state that changed in just five years. It's not possible. You talk about some of the largest organizations in the world. 
You talk about Coca-Cola, you talk about Apple, you talk about this. It took decades for these organizations to become great. The principle is fundamental. Now someone stands before you, takes advantage of your ignorance, and he tells you a nation that has gone through hell for 50, 60, 70 years of existence, in three years, is going to change the nation. That's not true. What is true is that in the next five years, if you elect me, I'm going to make life painful. I'm going to make sure that things are put in place. The five years is going to be the years of sacrifice. You may not get the things you are used to, where you have to follow rules, and I'm going to make it so that the next five years will be years of harvest and plenty. That's the truth. That's why in team we don't promise you heaven and earth. I tell you the truth. Because the truth is painful. The truth is hard. But that truth is your path to a prosperous future. That truth is your path to power. That truth is your path to the place that we ought to be. Where you ought to be. Team did not happen by accident. It was all planned. Years of hard work powered by God's love and grace. This is where sometimes the story gets complicated. We talk about grace as if grace tells you not to do anything. Grace multiplies hard work and gives you a successful outcome. It does not tell you to do nothing. To do nothing simply means to get nothing. Grace empowers you to do much more than everyone. This was what Paul said. He said, I worked hard than everyone that came before me. I did much more. He said, yet not I. But the grace of God that works the power that works in me. I am what I am by the grace of God. Grace helps you to do uncommon things. Grace takes ordinary men and makes them extraordinary men and women. But grace is never idle. Grace compels obedience. It helps you to do things. Jesus was a personification of grace. The Bible tells me how Jesus went about doing good for God was with him. Grace makes you to do things. If you aren't doing, you are doing injustice to grace. We do things. We create things. We bring God's purpose to this planet. We make the world a better place. We live intentional lifestyles. I was telling Sister Vicky yesterday, I said, I am not afraid of what the devil thinks he can do to me because I have run my race. Hey, and I'm running my race. Today, if they tell me, you're going home, I'm not going to be worried because I know that a man lived on this planet and he fulfilled his destiny. Some of you are frustrated because you don't understand your purpose. Your husband can't define your purpose for you. Your wife can't define your purpose for you. You must know why God has called you. Called you to this planet. He didn't call you to complain. He didn't call you to be a liability to your family, to your spouse, to your husband, to your wife, to your relatives. He called you to be a blessing. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 tells me, In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Live a life that becomes a blessing to your spouse. Live a life that becomes a blessing to your children. Live a life that becomes a blessing to your community. Live a life that becomes a blessing to nations of the earth. You must live a life that helps you give values to people. If all your friendship is just to take, then something is wrong. I taught my kids. Biological and adopted. You must always live for a cause bigger than self. Like every other person, I want to live long. 
a life of satisfaction. But there are times you need to choose whether living long or living well is what the trouble. If living long means disobeying God's will and allowing my society to go into flames, I don't want to live long. I want to live an intentional life, even if it means planting my life as a seed to stop evil. God has placed us on this planet. Do not allow your convenience to stop you from fulfilling your purpose. Sometimes your purpose may lead to your early death. You know, long life is God's will for us. But sometimes it's not also God's will for certain people. Because if you check the book of Revelation, certain people died before the time. And they said, God, why haven't you avenged their death? And God said, no, there are people like you I have ordained who are going to die as martyrs for the gospel. I will not avenge you until the time is fulfilled. The reason our society is so broken is because some of you are so afraid. You rather become the governor's friend and the mayor's friend and the president's friend than to tell the truth. Sometimes the truth takes you away from certain friendships. But the purpose of God will always stand. Hallelujah. The Bible tells me in the book of Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Israel stayed in bondage for 430 years. Why? 30 years extra. Do you know why? Because someone in that generation did not speak. God works with times and seasons. And when the season of change comes, it's going to raise a leader to effect that change. You need to understand your purpose. There is a time for everything. If you try to go into premature limelight, that limelight is going to destroy you. God raises you up. He begins to prepare you in the time of silence. He's doing something. When you think he's doing nothing, he's doing everything. He prepares you. It depends on how big the assignment is. If a tree has to be a very big tree, God makes sure that the root is very, very deep. You don't see the roots, but you definitely see the fruit. If your assignment is big, God is going to isolate you and take you to the place where he raises you up and prepares you for the great assignment, for a ministry that had a lifespan of three years. Jesus Christ was raised and trained by God for 30 years. Think. Some of you love the exposure. Premature exposure is going to kill you. Premature exposure is going to destroy you. Those who can kneel before God privately we stand before kings. The problem is some of you want to stand before kings. No substance. Nothing. In your silence, God teaches you integrity. In your silence, It gives you faith. In your silence, it gives you knowledge. So that when you come out, you are loaded with spiritual matters to change your destiny. Don't be an empty vessel. Allow God to fill you up. Allow God to load you up with knowledge. When you speak, the Bible says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as an oracle of God. Some of you, you look for limelight and when they give you limelight, you speak nonsense. Absolute trash. If you have nothing to say, keep quiet. Because no word is ever idle before God. The Bible tells me that every man is going to give an account of every idol where they've spoken before God. Understand your purpose. And so Israel, that was supposed to be in bondage for 400 years, ended up doing 30 years extra. How did it happen? Exodus 2, 23 to 24. Now, it happened in the process of time. Say time. Time. There are times of plenty 
and there are times of leanness. There are times of greatness and there are times of disaster. But God permits them all. Joseph gave a profound statement when Pharaoh had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph gave him a profound answer. He said there's going to be seven years of plenty and there's going to be seven years of harvest. In the years of plenty, store up something so that when the leanness comes, you know what to do. There are certain prayers I prayed in the past that kept me alive today. Jesus told Peter, Peter, the devil desires to shake you like a reed. But I prayed for you. When the time comes, that your faith will not fail you. There are some prayers I no longer pray. Because during my days of preparation, I prayed all manner of prayers. And now in my time of assignment, I declare all manner of things. A declaration that comes to pass is a product of a person who has spent quality time in prayer. Women, sometimes I don't understand you. If you know your what, you are not going to be desperate. I may not have all the answers, but I know something. I deliberately studied the life of certain women who were not married. I'm not saying every woman who doesn't get married, who's not married, is guilty. Some don't want to get married by choice. But others who want to get married and they ain't married, many of the research I did, I discovered that they have certain things in common. They don't submit. They are rude. And no man wants to get a woman who's rude. There are certain virtues that if you don't possess them, God is not going to give you the things you're looking for. Paul said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. God did not give him certain things in that state. As long as you're still behaving like a servant, God is not going to treat you like a son. But you must prove that you are more than a servant and you're a son. You must prove that you're more than a son, that you are a friend then God is going to reveal his secrets to you. God reveals secrets to sons. He reveals secrets to his friends. If you aren't hearing from God, it's because you have not invested enough in your relationship with God. Do you know his voice? He can talk to you. He wants to talk to you. But have you spent quality time to identify his voice? How can you hear from someone you are distant from? If I'm in Alabang and you hear and there is no communication gadget, even if I call your name, you won't hear my voice. Why? Because the process of communication is distant. You must initiate it through obedience and prayer. Hallelujah. And faith gives you that key. So the people of Israel were in bondage 30 years extra. Why? Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Until we pray. God is not going to change a system you have called a system. You must understand that there are times to be silent and there is a time for you to pray. If you want to see revolution in every spectrum of life in this nation, you must learn how to pray and begin to do your own part. The change must begin with the way you think. Because the way you think will determine how you pray. And how you pray will determine what you get. And because they prayed, they knew there was a restlessness inside of them that the time for change has come. 
in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 34, God said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. The reason you have not seen revival in your country is because you have not prayed. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send in the harvesters. If you want to see the apostles, if you want to see the prophets, if you want to see the teachers, if you want to see the evangelists and pastors, pray to God and he's going to give you shepherds after his own heart. Not bickering. It is done in prayer. I perceive in my spirit that there is a harvest. A great harvest is happening right now in the Philippines. And I declare that God will send in the laborers from the north, east, west, and south. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Despite the variation in brutality of time and season, the purpose of God will stand because he never fails. Now let me say something that you may not really like. A couple of years back, someone was running for a certain position, so the wife came. The spouse of this person came and was asking, man of God, is my spouse going to get this position? He's leading in the service. I said he's going to lose with one million votes. Why would you say that? I said because his time has not yet come. Eventually the elections took place. This person lost. And they sent a representative to me. I said God said redemption is going to come for this person. I don't know why God is going to give this person redemption. And by certain time he's going to get the presidency of this nation. Now, someone is going to say, but why would you say that? I don't know what God wants to do. And I don't have the power to change anything. That which I have seen, I'm going to tell you. And the victory of this person is going to be a monumental victory. Something that will make history in the Republic of the Philippines. What God wants to do, I don't know. But I'm not going to call names. You may already know this person. Glory be to God. So back to what I was saying. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 to 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Can you imagine? Is it possible for you to change God's counsel? You may not like his counsel because he knows something that you don't know. He's just as the earth is higher than the heavens, so are his ways. I don't know the season of your life you're struggling with, but all you need to do is to submit to the will of God. If it's God that took you into that season, it's going to take you out of that season. And the end product of obeying God's will is promotion and power and fame. I declare that God is going to take you to your next season in the mighty name of Jesus. A season of power, a season of greatness, a season of excellence, a season of productivity. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. The Bible tells me in the book of Psalm 33 verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Say it stands. I don't know what God spoke concerning you, but it will stand. I don't know what God spoke concerning your business, it will stand. I don't know what God spoke concerning your health, it will stand. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. It will come to pass in your home if you believe that shout hallelujah. The Bible tells me in the book of Isaiah 40 chapter 8 the grass withers, the flower fades 
but the word of our God stands forever. What is it God spoke concerning you? Every prophetic word that God spoke concerning your business, concerning your health, concerning your destiny will come to pass. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have proposed, so it shall stand. God's purpose for your business will stand. God's purpose for your children will stand. God's purpose for the Philippines will stand. God's purpose for your home will stand. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. The Bible tells me in the book of Psalm 1 verse 3. He shall be like a tree. Say, I'm a tree. A tree of righteousness. Say, I am a tree of righteousness. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Those leaves also shall not wither, and whatever it does shall prosper. I prophesy into your life that you will bring forth your fruit of righteousness in your season. You will bring forth your fruit of productivity in your season. You will maximize profit in your business in your season. That season has come. The season of change has come. The season of growth has come. Arise and shine, for the glory of God has risen upon you. Arise and shine. Everything that is standing against you and your God's giving destiny is cancelled in the name of Jesus demons will not stop you flesh will not stop you wrong decisions will not stop you your time to shine has come your time for God to favor you has come because God surrounds you with favor like a shield be favored in your business be favored in your marriage be favored in your health wherever you go let the spirit of favor follow you if you believe that shout hallelujah The Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you may be in this state where you don't have so much. But God is not going to forsake you. Because the Bible says in due time. It's going to promote you in due time. It's going to give you wealth in due time. It's going to give you a harvest. Just be patient. He will never leave nor forsake you. Wherever you are, whatever season you found yourself, I came and I prophesied into your destiny that you will rise to the next level of glory and power. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Everything that is about to stop you, every handwriting of the devil, every incantation, every spell, every enchantment against your destiny has been cancelled in the name of Jesus. I abolish the handwriting of death, abolish the handwriting of sickness, abolish the handwriting of frustration. The time for you to shine has come. The time for you to be free has come. The time for you to go through liberation has come. This is your time. Give three people a half five and say i am coming out victorious prosperous productive if you believe that shout hallelujah god established physical elements to guide and help us understand and possess our spiritual inheritance the bible tells me in the book of matthew chapter 24 verse 32 now learn this parable from the fig tree. Isn't God great? He's giving us teachers everywhere. He's giving us things to learn from. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Look at the state of your life. For some of you, Summer is around the corner. How would you know? Because when the heat gets really intense, know that rain is about to fall. I do not measure the abundance of rain by the availability of rain. I measure the abundance of rain by the intensity of the heat that I feel. Because when your life is so hot and tight, and when the heat is so strong, know that redemption is coming. I declare that I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. 
I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Someone is about to step into the finish line. Someone is about to step into victory. Someone is about to step into prosperity. Receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible tells me in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power, and guarded so that they are without excuse. Luke chapter 21 verse 11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilence, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But know that the end has not come. Know that the end is near. Say the end is near. So therefore you must live an intentional life. Knowing that this planet is about to pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But the word of God will never pass away. Your purpose will never pass away. Because your purpose is tied to the word of God. Without the word of God there is no purpose. That means your purpose on this planet will never, never, never pass away. We are going to heaven as a temporary home. Because we are coming back to rule upon the face of the earth. If you believe that shout hallelujah. Some of you think we're going to go to heaven and stay there forever. No. Say, so we're coming back. Oh, come on, say, say, we are coming back. Some of you may come back as governors. Some of you will come back as presidents. Some of you will come back as ambassadors. But one thing I know, I am coming back. Even when I die and I go to heaven, I will surely come back to this planet. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. So, we are earthbound. Hallelujah. Because the purpose of God is not for us to live in heaven, but to come back and live on this planet. But it's going to be a new earth. A world without COVID-19. A world without cancer. A world where lions and sheep can fellowship together. A world without violence. A world without terrorists. Say, I'm definitely coming back. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Luke chapter 21 verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. The book of Revelation is not a horror movie. It's a book of redemption. When you see all this crisis happening, Bishop Cardin and, and Sister Vicky and the rest, do not be afraid. It says, your redemption draws near. So definitely, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything is going to work out for our own good. Tell your neighbor, say, it's going to work out for my good. Whether there is hunger, it's going to work out for my good. Whether there is war in another country, it's going to work out for my good. Whether there is this, it's going to work out for my good. Because my redemption draws near. In the law of time and season, the strength of your input will determine the quality of your output. The apostle said, my life has been offered as a seed. Is your life offered as a seed? I'll tell you about three nations. Let's take a look at Singapore. 60 something years ago, that place was one miserable fishing village. A den of gangsters and thieves. A man had a dream. He walked. Intentional living. He made policies. He planned. And Singapore became the fastest developed states on earth. And the greatest economic model of the 21st century. Turned that place into a city state. Because he planned. How about Dubai? 
It is one of the richest cities in the world, comparable with the richest New York. It has the busiest airport in the world. And it records the most number of tourists in any city in the world. It was a desert. The development of Dubai took place in less than 50 years. Now you are going to say, all oh, these are, one is in Asia, one is in the Middle East. Let's go to Africa. I don't know if you heard of a country called Rwanda. There was a brutal civil war in that country, and almost one million people were killed as a result of genocide. All it took is one leader, one leader to take Rwanda, a wasteland, and turned it into the modern-day Singapore of Africa. A nation where unemployment rate is less than 1%. Sixty-one percent of the politicians are women. They have the greatest gender equality in the world, in government. And over 84 so 86% of the women are involved in the labor force. A paradise on earth. Crime rate almost zero. Because a man planned. During the civil war, the president was a rebel leader. After he conquered the people who brought problems to that nation, he stood as an elder statesman and he turned the tribes together. He brought them together. He gave them one dream. What is your dream? Nothing happens without planning. He understood that every season of waste will be rewarded with a season of harvest if you plan well. In every waste, in every despair, in every gloom, there is a potential for the harvest of light. For those who discern, for those who understand, for those who know that seasons are not permanent, they begin to invest in wastelands because they know that in every waste there is light coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. When Africa had problems, Western nations ran away from Africa. Chinese ran to Africa. Now the West is complaining. How come China has taken over and made investment everywhere? Because the Chinese know how to do wise business. They'll tell you anytime something is terribly wrong in a nation, that is an opportunity for you to go rebuild. Because when you rebuild, you'll be the only one standing. Hallelujah. The question is, is your life a seed? The Bible tells me in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Samuel was a great prophet. But the mom had to groom him. He grew in the faith. He grew in the knowledge. While he was yet unknown, something was happening in his life. You may not be known right now. The publicity is not a problem. What will you do with the publicity? Some of you are just hugging publicity. Imagine people like Whitney Houston. They grew up in the church. They were so quick to embrace the limelight. What happened to Whitney Houston? The limelight destroyed her. Take time. Allow God to mold you. I've seen people here who are talented. I tell them, there's nothing wrong with your talent. Grow in the house of God. Because if you're a godly artist with the values of righteousness, even when the limelight comes, you will define the limelight. But if you are not standing, when you go into the limelight, you do drugs and do all manner of things. Take your time out to grow in the presence of God. David was a prosperous king. David was a, an intentional king. David was a revolutionary king. David spent quality time in the presence of God. It is shameful. Some of you say, I can't come to church because I have a business meeting. You ain't going far. Because if you can't make God first, 
The Bible tells me in the book of Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and every other thing will be given unto you. If you go after the things, these things will determine your destiny. The type of choices you make will reveal how far you can go. There are some people from other faith. If they don't pray, they are going nowhere. Sometimes if you travel with them, they'll say, stop the bus. We have to do our prayer. What's wrong with us Christians? Christians are the only people, sorry I can't come to church because I, I've seen many times when world leaders said we should meet on Sunday. I said, no, no. I cannot sacrifice my Sunday. You sacrifice everything. You sacrifice your worship. How can God trust you? Oh, sorry, I can't come to church. I have to sign a business. Let the business do wait. Unless the Lord builds, those who build, build in vain. You can't have it both ways. Why is Denzel Washington such a great actor? You know why? His father was a pastor. And he has lived by the Bible principles. Among the actors, he's one of the few without scandal. I've seen too many people who ought to be grounded. They were in a hurry to get into the limelight. They all got destroyed by the limelight. Seek God first. Let God define you. The Bible study you are willing to take is going to defend you when adversity comes. Because in the word of God there is wisdom. There is knowledge. The word of God creates the right values in you. All the wisdom I got did not come from the schools I attended. Came from the Bible. And what my father taught me. Most of the wisdom came from the Bible. The knowledge came from the Bible. I did not attend a business school. I have passed the best exams on business, MBA exams, qualifying with high grades. Not because I learned it anywhere, because I learned it from the Bible. The Bible is not just a spiritual book. Is the greatest revolutionary book you can get. You see it as just one book, you are wasting your time. It gives you ideas. It helps you to create wealth. My ability to create wealth did not come from attending business schools. It came from the Bible. Hallelujah. The best leadership training I got did not come from the best leadership institute. It came from the Bible. 1 Samuel 2, 26. And the child Samuel grew in favor both with the Lord and man. When you spend time with God, you grow in wisdom and favor, not just with man, but with God. The Bible says, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he will cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. Hallelujah. And look at the purpose of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verse 79 to 80. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. He was in the desert, kept by God, exposed to the presence of God, but kept away from the crowd. God is not going to give you to the crowd if you've not given yourself to him. If you give yourself to the crowd without spending time with God, the crowd will devour you. He stayed until the day of his manifestation came. 
if you attempt to manifest before your time, you are going to be frustrated. The disciples could preach a storm. But Jesus told them, wait. Wait. Don't go anywhere. Because there is something I know that you need. And he told them in Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then shall you be my witness. Any representation of God that is not backed by the power of God becomes a show. Paul said, we do not speak with enticing words of men's wisdom. We came to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. If you ask me to do crusades for the sake of crusades without power and people can't get healed and no, nothing happens, then I'm not prepared to do that. That's just going to be a show. We speak because we know. We speak because we have a conviction. And we speak because we know that the power of God is real. But you must wait for God to empower you before you go out. Luke chapter 2. 39 to 40. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the law, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. If you don't allow yourself to grow in the things of God, you will lack wisdom, you will lack favor, and you will lack God's grace. You must give yourself time to grow. You can't be a successful leader if you just want the position. You must grow into all things. That's why God takes us from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from power to power. Believers must embrace every season with gratitude because God can use any situation to elevate those who love him. In your season of lack, what do you do? Do you complain? Romans 8, 28. And we know. Say, I know. I know. Say it with all the conviction you have in your spirit. Say, I know. I know. I like that. Even children know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things. Say, all things. All things. Not some things. All things, your disappointment, your heartbreak, your pain, the good days, the bad days, the hard times, all things will work out for your own good. Hallelujah. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. The criteria and the requirement is, do you love God? Do you love God? Yes. Are you called yes. according to God's purpose? Yes. Then know that if you're going through a hard times, you don't need to complain because eventually all things will work out for your own good. Yes. The Bible tells me in the book of Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good. So don't grow weary. I know some of you have the tendency of saying, you don't know what I'm going through. Bishop, I've had enough. I've been there. Relax. Good times are coming. If the devil can show you bad times, God sent me to tell you that good days are coming. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You know, when me and Bishop Cardin, we started Team Philippines, today you celebrate the grace. It was not always easy. There were times when we started, the church is full, and we're saying, hallelujah. The next Sunday, empty. But we didn't lose hope. We knew that good times will come, and bad times will come. But we kept dreaming. We kept talking about this building. 
We kept talking about the things God wants to do. We kept talking and talking. Some of the pastors even told us that we were just talking nonsense. Because they didn't see what we were saying. We saw in the spirit realm. We confessed what we saw. We talked like the richest men on this planet. We were confident of victory. There were times the church had money in abundance. There were times that the church account was red. But in everything, we never complained against God. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Do you want to reap? Then keep the right mental attitude. Philippians 4, 12. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I've seen all manner of things. There was a time I was in Lucena and all I could afford was a jeepney. Not even my jeepney. A rented jeepney. But I I enjoyed the jeepney as if I was in a limousine. Because in your season of jeepney, praise God. Hallelujah. Learn how to enjoy every season. Because no condition in Christ is permanent. We move from glory to glory. Ecclesiastes 3, 11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Hallelujah. Don't rush God. In his time, he's going to make your expectation beautiful. In his time, he's going to make your business beautiful. In his time, he's going to make your health beautiful. In his time, he's going to make your dreams beautiful. Because everything will be done according to God's time, not your time. If you can wait for him, he will make your marriage beautiful. He will make your home beautiful. He will make your health beautiful. Your time to shine has come. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The process is something God is not going to tell you. Did he tell you how he made you? So sometimes he's not obliged to tell you how he's going to do it. Our duty is not to say, how can it be? No. Your duty is to say, when, Lord? The how belongs to God. The curiosity to ask when belongs to us. Hallelujah. Your knowledge of time and seasons will determine your capacity to rise to greatness and glory or fall into defeat and despair. There's something I want to show you in the book of 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, They had understandings of times. When God gives you the knowledge of times and season, it's not for you to keep it to yourself, but to do something. This season that God has revealed in your business, this season that God has revealed in your work with him, what are you going to do? I know my season. I've gone through the first phase of my life. I've completed the second phase of my life. I have entered the third and final phase of my life. What phase have you entered? You should know what to do. Because if you don't know what to do, it's going to be difficult for you to have expectation. Expectation without deliberate vision is just fantasy. The sons of Issachar knew what to do. In this season, you should know what to do economically, know what to do spiritually, know what to do.
Because Issachar had knowledge, they became strong. Genesis 49, 14. Issachar is a strong donkey. Lying between two burdens. He learned how to carry burdens. Why? Because he was a strong donkey. Uh, you know, a donkey represents a vessel that God uses. Because when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they gave him a donkey. Are you a strong donkey of righteousness? Are you a strong vessel of righteousness? You cannot be a strong vessel of righteousness carrying burdens when you don't know what to do. You must know when to pray, when to study the word of God, so that the word of God can lead you, so that the spirit of God can lead you in all things. Ephesians 5. 15 to 17, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you understand the will of God? Defeat is inevitable when believers attempt to rest when God instructs them to fight. Some of you are resting, but this is not the time for you to rest. Some of you are stepping into your rest. Some of you are stepping into your battles. You need to understand your times and seasons. Second Samuel 11, 1 to 3. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. What did David do? He stayed at home. <laughs> It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? How did David fall into that sin? He refused to go out to battle as a king. The reason some of you keep falling into the temptation of the flesh, there are times that God's spirit will nudge you to pray. The Bible says the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. You can't defeat the flesh by saying, oh, the law of this. Bring 2,088 laws. The flesh will defeat you. If you don't ask for spiritual assistance, only the spirit can defeat the flesh, not your knowledge. It is the spirit of God that has power to defeat the flesh. So sometimes the only way to defeat the flesh is just to pray. It's not to go into logic. The Bible says, he that stands should take heed lest he falls. Because I've seen the flesh. It can mess you up. It can mess me up. It can mess anyone up. Even the greatest apostle. He said, the things I ought not to do. Who will deliver me from this flesh? Don't tell me he had a spiritual problem. No. Apostle Paul struggled with the flesh. Even Jesus, the Son of God, said, the Bible says he was tempted. How can God be tempted? Because he carried flesh. As long as you carry flesh, temptation is going to come. But what is the solution? Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, this explains something. What you say is a born-again Christian. Because when you got born again, your flesh did not get born again. The Spirit of God does not save your flesh. It only quickens your flesh. It only controls your flesh. Your flesh can never be saved. Your flesh is going back to the dust. You came from the dust and you're going back. If your flesh was such a great flesh, God wouldn't have given you a glorified body. That's why the Bible says the spirit is willing. So the guy is born again. His spirit is willing. But the flesh, but the flesh. So how do you deal with the flesh? Pray in the spirit and you will not fulfill 
the desires of the flesh. Everyone under the influence of the flesh, I declare that God's grace is coming upon you to overcome it in Jesus' name. Extraordinary people are defined by exceptional virtues developed over a while to transform societies. If you can't sacrifice for your vision, you can never make an impact in your world. Hebrews 10, 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will. David came to fulfill his purpose. That is why you must learn how to fulfill your purpose. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. It's God's word within your heart. Isaiah 50, verse 5. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Now for young people, Psalm 119, verse 9 to 10. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Acts chapter 13, 36. For David, say David. What did he do? For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. You must not die before serving your generation. Under God's purpose, death is only permitted when you finish your assignment. For some of you, it's time for you now to discover your purpose. Why are you here? When are you going to fulfill that call? In conclusion, when David, who was one of the greatest men that ever lived, was about to die, he said something. And this is what I'm going to tell you, what he told his son. You know, when a man is dying, the last words are the most important things he says. He tells you either the things he kept hidden or he tells you his greatest secret. When David was dying, he called a son. Aren't we all sons of David? Come on, aren't we all sons of David? You want to know what he told Solomon? First Kings 2, 1 to 4. Now, the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgment, and his testimonies. Hallelujah. He went further to say, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do. And wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. He told Solomon, He said, Prove yourself a man. So being a man is not just a biological function. Real men. What they do is they walk in the ways of God and they keep his statutes and his commandments and they execute his judgments and they testify. Do we have real men in this house? Now someone is going to say, why are you talking about the men? How about the women? Yes, if you check the book of Proverbs, there are certain things that makes up a woman. Virtues. Qualities that God sees. And once God sees those qualities in you, when the time comes, men from the north, east, west, and south, they begin to come. Why? Because you have been able to prove yourself a woman. A virtuous woman. What does a virtuous woman do? You wake up early in the morning. You don't eat the bread of idleness. 
You do things. That is what makes you a woman. You help the man. The man who marries a virtuous woman stays at the city gate. He's all pleased. Some of you are just wives in letters. A real woman is not idle. What makes you a woman is not go on Facebook and you paint your lipstick and you say, mirror, mirror, what's the finest? Me, 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 me. With 1,088 likes, 200,000 likes does not make you a woman. It is the word of God that makes you a woman. Beating up women and doing all manner of things and having girlfriends all over the place does not make you a man. You ain't a real man. A real man pursues the statutes of God. In other words, you cannot influence the environment. You know why? Because the environment was given to us. People of influence. That whatever we bound on earth will be bound in heaven. That is not an authority that is given to those who are not prepared. But I can do it. No, you cannot do it. He said, when your obedience is complete, then shall you avenge every form of disobedience. The reason your house, you have a man in the house and the house, the children are all going crazy and no one can control them because the man is not being a man in the house. It's just a biological being with all the features of a man. But it's not acting like a man. Man, prove to your God that you're a true man. I, I can't go to church. Your wife is the one teaching you the Bible. Shame on you. It is the man that teaches his house. Teaches his household about righteousness. And it is the woman that manages the home. A maid managing your house? Check the virtuous woman. Who teaches the maids? A maids run your home. There are certain values your children will never have unless the man gives it to the children. There are certain values they will not have unless the woman gives it. I don't know where you've been, but I came as the voice of God this last day to tell you Go back to the place that God has called you to be. There are many of you here. For years you don't sleep with your husbands. I'm angry with him. That's not a marriage. That's a fraud. You are breaking the laws of God. And in the spirit realm you can never be one. You're already separated. Because intimacy is not just intimacy. It is a spiritual tool. When a man enters a woman, they become one. They begin to think alike. They do things alike. It's a spiritual tool. Marriage is not a contract. It is a covenant. And when you break the covenant, it is not the certificate that determines the covenant, Bishop Cardin. It is your actions. When you break it, it is broken. Oh, but, but we have the certificate. You are not wise. The certificate is not the marriage. The covenant is. It is dangerous to stand against the purpose of a man or woman of God. That is why we give you all an opportunity today. If you are not living right. This is not about your salvation now. We are all saved. Right? This is about your conduct. If you have not conducted yourself as a child. As a husband. As a wife, I want you to stand to your feet and I'm going to pray for you. Good day, everyone. My name is Jasmine Henry. My life has been transformed positively and continuously by Tony Mario High's messages. You should definitely check it out and make sure to subscribe to his channel.